Greetings, dear viewers. It is the end of December, the final episode in this year with Alexei Rostovich. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Right, 30th of December, right. Glad to see everybody. All right, me too. Dear friends, we are live. It is 9 p.m., five minutes past 9 p.m. That means that you can leave all your questions, comments, all the hate and all the love, please leave in the chat, but make sure you also leave questions. The most interesting will be voiced here, and we'll present Alexei with them. What doesn't change is that, as always, I want to express my deep gratitude to armed forces of Ukraine that allow us to stay alive and to even conduct these streams. So let's start today in Kharkov during the air raid sirens. There are reports about five and now six explosions. Mayor of Kharkov also verified that one of the multi-story buildings was hit in the middle of the city. More details are being verified. And as he wrote in his message, we'll provide more data as we investigate what else was hit and who else uh, got injured. So now the alarm is sounding in most parts of Ukraine. Russians have launched Shahid UAVs as we are doing the stream. Everything to the south of Kyiv and to the east is already red, so I think we'll get red colored in Kyiv soon as well. But before we go to questions and proceed with the stream, I want to read your fresh post that just appeared several hours ago. And I quote, I quote our guest, somebody would say it's a bad tone, but uh, I still insist. You know, I would listen to Aristovich. People say he's a rather smart guy and posts interesting things. All right, so I thought it's important to quote Alexei at the beginning of this stream. So, here it comes. I have to officially inform my readers that the period of scares coming from me is officially over. No problems and deficiencies have not disappeared, and dangers are still here. We'll be talking about them, but it doesn't make sense to scare anymore. We could be scaring, and it, it made sense, until yesterday's massive hit from, in quotes, brotherly neighbor. Now, again, either us or them, in parentheses, of course us. And now we need the period of conversations about rationality, meanings and understanding, Without them, it'll be difficult for us to win. And as for the enemy, the stronger it is, the more difficult, the more interesting it will be win, to win for us. Back at the beginning of war, we only had one choice, to stand and to shoot and to hold, and we can stand again. Thank you, everybody. Don't leave the room. Those who are afraid, you are correct. But still, we will have a lot of optimism now. End of quote. Right, I remember I asked you to end the previous stream on the optimistic note and to charge people with optimism. Can I rely, after this post, which I just read, that today's stream... Oh yeah, right, it will be rather full with optimism, but I think I will be um, talking about a lot of optimism from here onward until I again decide to change the tone. All right, and also at the end of this year, we do want to charge people with some optimism and faith. Right, Vasily. And why the whole change is that it feels again that we are in the corner, like at the February and March of 22. I looked at these uh, faithful allies of Ukraine, what discussions they lead, how they go into help, the reasons, logic, the actions of actors, motivations, and I have a full feeling now of March of 22. And if you are, first of all, in the corner, first, then why do you scare people? We shouldn't. And if we're fighting, there is no other options, then we are fighting. Just like in that movie, I'm a sailor, and that's why I fight, right? Pretty much. And when you have nothing to lose, you have to be optimistic and fierce. So we'll be infectionally fierce and optimistic, and... Uh, Despite that, of course, we will address the deficiencies as long as they're present. Guys, please do not forget to click the like button. We already have about uh, 14,800 people watching. 
do not forget to click that button and do not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel, to Vasil Galavanov's channel, and to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English. Now, not probably on the importance of the event, but uh, on the freshness of it, as the UAVs are flying at, over Ukraine and hitting targets here, in Russian Belgorod there were several explosions, and in the middle of uh, the city there were several reports of incidents, and the uh, Russian side is stating that their air defense systems were targeting Ukrainian missiles, Ukrainian flying objects, and um, just remnants of them that fell in the middle of the city, and there were a couple of provocations as well, that's what Russian side reports. Well, let's see, our side, I was privy to making some of these decisions, what will be hit. There is a, still a direct no to hitting civilian targets in Russia and on the occupied territories. So despite the second year of war, we're still a European army that does not attack civilians. This is a bit different flavor here, that some people are happy about Belgorod being hit in that fashion, and uh, they put it up on the banners They that uh, some children and some civilians uh, were hurt. And here I caution those people from not doing that. The laws of military, the laws unspoken and spoken laws of war, tell you to not be happy about the death of the enemy. Be happy about your gains, about your successes. Don't be happy about death. And um, it's a very thin line, but basically these uh, approaches, these ethics prevent the fortune of war from turning away from you. But you're a psychologist, Alexei, you know that people do that. Exactly, and that's why I'm saying you have to resist it. And as Strugatsky said in uh, one of their sci-fi novels, what is very natural to animals is uh, not so natural. We, we should be staying away from that. We, as humans, should be staying away from all that. You should be happy about your successes, about the successes of war, but not about deaths of the other side. It's not even right to be happy about the military forces of enemy dying at the front. We should be happy about the achievements of our troops. It is a very thin line, I understand, but we need to hold it. Because it's uh, wrong when we see the bodies of civilians and uh, some children, you should not be screaming for joy. Are you guys mad? We're humans, we don't do that. So, do you think, Alexei, the attacks on Belgrade will repeat again? Do you think there will be more attacks on uh, military objects on the territory of Russian Federation? Yeah, I think there will be. They'll be trying to hit us, they're still doing it, and uh, we will continue to hit their targets. Now note that they were not talking, they were not attacking us for quite a long time, right? And now they uncorked that practice again yesterday. And that was one of the reasons when I switched the tone and started talking more about scary things, because it doesn't make sense to scare people when things are real bad. And now they're killing people again in mass. They're launching missile at us. It's not the time to keep people afraid. I used the window when I had it to bring difficult topics. It lasted roughly from the end of September to about today, yesterday. But after this massive attack on Ukraine by Russia again with missiles and everything they have flying, it's time to switch the tone. So they will be hitting us. We will be hitting them. But once again, regardless of what they are happy about in their chats, in their social media, when you see the print screens that they're happy about hitting the birthing place and schools and all that. Please, dear, dear compatriots, dear Ukrainians, do not be giddy, do not celebrate the deaths of people on the other side. And I will show you a very serious threat. Um, I'm not even talking about moralizing things here. There is a serious threat that several countries dependent upon Russia might join their collective suit against Ukraine, claiming it to be a terrorist state or using supposedly terrorist measures. And as a proof, they will show some deaths of their civilians and as emotional proof, they will show the comments in the Ukrainian media and the Ukrainian social networks. And we absolutely do not need that, trust me. Alexei, screenshot from social media is not a proof. 
Vasily, it's not a proof, it's not a factual proof, it's emotional proof. All people in all courts, even judges and diplomats, they can be swayed with emotions. Don't be happy about the deaths of enemies. Um, that lesson was very well learned by Israeli Defense Forces and Israeli society. Their IDF is fighting fiercely in Gaza, but they're not happy, they're not celebrating deaths of people on the front, even if these people are their enemies, because they know that all any any sign of that will be pumped and noticed anywhere by all the Muslims uh, in the world and also by Harvard and other institutions that are waiting for a chance to jump on that wagon. And this is a just emotions generated by these topics. So we don't need to pump that. Our all support depends on our allies and our partners. If Harvard and the like will start pumping the topic that Ukraine is using terrorist methods, this will not help us getting more American aid, which is already problematized to the umpteenth degree here. But the, right, the truth is on our side, Alexei. Yeah, the truth is, but not too many people share it by default. And the world works differently. I brought the stats to you in one of the streams that 79% of Americans between 18 and 24 think that the whites and Jews are responsible for all the troubles in the planet. So on that fertile soil, all this commentary falls um, and produces very weird results. So we have to be extra careful. All right, we'll talk about the aid later. We already touched upon the topic of a record-breaking attack, 122 missiles, 36 UAVs. The number of dead only in Kyiv is already at 16. On the 1st of January will be flags down day. In Zaporozhye, six dead. In Odessa, four. Our condolences to the families of deceased. And what do you think became the reason for that record? And I don't want to use the record here because usually it's used as positive connotation, but right, like a black record, negative record. What was the reason for that attack? Well, on the surface, there was recent sink, successful sinking of big uh, descent ship in uh, Novichirka, uh, the Novichirkask vessels. We also shot down five of their jets recently, so I think now they're very angry. I think they were saving all these missiles for, roughly speaking, New Year and holidays, but since these events happened, they wanted to produce an emotional answer, because war is also a polit political affair, and they have to listen to the emotions of their population and their army, or maybe they actually have planned the strike. But in any case, they were saving these resources to execute this attack. Now, in any case, they're attacking our energy systems less, paradoxically. Probably the weather is not really supportive. There is not too much frost here in Ukraine this winter. And they're just trying to hit military production sites. But we know how they're hitting, right? They're not too accurate. And they're mostly hitting civilian targets instead. And Russian army has a very distinct feature. They never were swayed by collateral damage. For European army, that would be a serious factor because they'll be selecting targets far away from uh, civilians to avoid unnecessary deaths and victims. Russia was never stopped with that factor, with that consideration. So they have reserved enough missiles. They used a lot of them. They used all kinds of missiles ballistic missiles, they only didn't use calibers because we indeed crippled their ability to use them from the naval-based launchers. But I think that overall they will not be able to sustain the intensity similar to the last year's winter. But we'll see. Right, plus our air defense systems are a little better, Alexei. True, they are better. We do want more though. and. Our Western partners are fantastic, right? I cannot not speak about that flaw again. 77 American parts in Russian Kinjal dagger missile. What is that about? Now, a hundred complexes of Patriot systems, hundred units of them, would do all the work. To cover Ukraine completely, we can probably use 50 to just cover the skies from Russian side. But uh, we barely got 10 
or so. So, you know, people accuse me of scaring me them with different statements. Once you read about all the components, uh, Western-made components and Russian missiles, you know, it's hard not to scare. Guys, once again, sorry if I distract from the screen and look somewhere down. Uh, I'm not being distracted from the stream. I'm checking. Right, right, Alexei. <laughs> Let's uh, once again mention to our viewers that when you see us looking down somewhere, we're not reading congratulations with New Year and uh, watching memes. We are reading your questions. We're trying to understand what you're asking about, what news are coming, to be able to comment on that. Same thing we had with Fagin, when people were accusing me of uh, taking my eyes off the screen. That's exactly what I was doing, reading questions and reading news and commentary. So that's exactly what Vasily is doing too. Right, and I'm also reading what's happening in regards to aerial attack that is unfolding now. So far, it's uh, only messages about Shahid UAVs. And the story shows that initially it's the wave of Shahids and then the missiles are to follow. Right, Shahids, they are used to un uncover the air defense systems. And by the way, there are several research uh, notes already uh, aired in public that Shahids are evolving. They're using them to uncover the air defense systems and uh, their configuration so they could hit them with missiles. So our enemies are learning. Now, in regards to the record-breaking attack. Some people are saying that they launched a lot, so there will be no attack on the new year. Oh yeah, there likely will be again. Right, I want to mention that last year they launched 69 before the new year, and then at the new year's night they continued carrying on and launching more. Oh yeah, there likely will be more, unfortunately. Soviet army and now Russian army, they always had uh, dates as symbols. They were always using dates for their attacks and uh, operations. So they will try to spoil our celebrations. It's almost guaranteed. Now, guys, once again, um, I do not like to ask for these likes. 26,000 are watching us live, but only 5,000 likes. So please uh, correct that if you can. Right, because otherwise, Shaitan ones and some other commentators will be talking later that they're mathematicians and somebody sent us stats about the rest which you use in streams and it looks like they're all produced artificially, right? So guys, please, uh, to stop them from this conspiracy, just click the like button because uh, people who think that they're mathematicians, uh, they might believe that they are and they might believe that they're also analysts after these things. So it's dangerous for them, first of all. Um, okay, so let's go to questions. The ones that uh, the first ones were written under the announcement of the stream. Uh, some of the first ones are related to crossing the border, that it is now made more difficult for men who could leave Ukraine before. And you said uh, that they're limited from leaving the country now anyway. No, but we're talking about special categories, uh, people with a lot of children, people with limited abilities. So those who could cross the border easily before, for example, with three children, they could not leave the country today, and the process was made much harder. So why do you think so, and why today? And this is all in the background of discussing new law about mobilization. Right, they're typing the bolts so that people who might fall under mobilization in its new read uh, would not leave the country. And I, as I said before, one of the main mistakes of our power is to complicate leaving the country. And we talked many times about how it can be improved, that people would be able to come back and uh, that they would not be facing the deterioration of the families due to them being split apart in different countries, that it doesn't look like the country is fighting for freedom. But uh, this decision can be judged only by its results, right? Me personally, I think this is a strategic mistake. But if somehow it will end up being a strategically right decision that allowed them to mobilize and to hold and to win this war, I can uh, accept that and we can analyze that later. But for now, it actually causes a lot of concerns with people, a lot of issues with people in, here in Ukraine that uh, Russians have started special campaign People are concerned that Russians might have started the anti-mobilization campaign that is threatening to attack the Ukrainian government. I want to say once again that no special services create these situations. They only use what's existing. 
I will quote uh, Vladimir Lenin here about creating revolutionary situation. He said, you must be a complete idiot to try to create revolutionary situation. It can only be created by history, but you have to be a complete idiot to not use it when it's already created. So they're not creating anything. They're just using our own mistakes to attack us. And our powers are conducting mobilization effort and communicate that mobilization effort in such a way that it provides a lot of pain points for Russians how to carry this out. And uh, at the time when there's a legal system that doesn't allow Ukrainians to leave the country, when we have categories of people who, according to the law, should be able to leave, but they're not being let go, it again outlines that it's difficult to believe our legal laws and systems because since you have a formal right to leave the country and then when you come to the border you're being told by the border guards that there is another regulation that is not a law but just internal regulation that stops uh, you from having this right well what if he has a pass that was obtained illegally right uh yes i understand Vasily. maybe uh, one of the pass or some of the passes are gotten in via some corruption methods but they are legal otherwise I actually had some discussing discussions with other guests before you, Alexei. I understand that the main message of our government now is that they want to put everybody on the list, on the list of mobilization uh, authorities. Right. I understand that they're trying to put everybody on the list and they're explaining that not everybody will be drafted. We just need to know our resource. Please don't be afraid to come and put your name on the list. Right. But the problem is, and, and you think that uh, people with many children will not be drafted? Yeah, I think those most likely will not be drafted. But still, the problem is that according to the law, you can cross the border. But you're being told by the border guards that you're not allowed to. And, you know, if the law is being violated on the border, why would the person trust that he it will not be violated in the drafting commission? So these things need to be explained properly. These things need to be communicated that starting at zero o'clock that day, you will not be able to leave the country without registering first with the drafting commission. So these things need to be explained properly. These things need to be communicated that starting at zero o'clock that day, you will not be able to leave the country without registering first with the drafting commission. But otherwise, when somebody comes from Kyiv, stood in that long line for 18 hours only to find out that he cannot leave the country. It doesn't add any faith to Ukrainian authorities into our current system. The faith can only be present if the powers communicate normally. They need to come out and talk to people and say it is war, they need to survive. And it doesn't mean that people with uh, big families will be drafted. But we need to understand strategically what resource do we have, so we need to calculate things and arrange the economy in the proper way. So people will understand, I think, if they address properly, right? People with over three kids will not be drafted, right? So we just need to know your military specialties because our potential is limited. And one day we might have to draft you, but right now you're not in danger, you'll preserve your rights to leave the country if you want to, you'll just have to satisfy that requirement that you also have to be on the list of the drafting commission. And you can provide additional ways for them, like if you're parents of uh, big families, there could be a certain day, so you know you don't stand in line too long. And somebody with a heavier weight like Mikhail Podolyak or another advisor to the president's office, or somebody who is responsible for mobilization, the president, by the way, is by law responsible for mobilization, should come out and say that, yeah, this is what we're doing, so people can exhale and don't get too nervous about it. They understand that it's, uh, in this case, that it would be blood and tears, but authorities are not hiding anything from them, right? So this is what we need to, to do, that just to communicate it right. And we have instead a Minister of Defense making statements that are being denounced three times a week by Podolyak and other people. Are you talking about the draft across uh, the border in the other countries? Yeah, some of those. Last week there was a circus. So point number one for running the country, do not bring to the level of extraordinary measures. If you got to the level of extraordinary measures, try to communicate well. If you cannot communicate well, then don't be upset. Have you seen the result of that decision to make sure that Ukrainians of the draftable age are now right, uh, creating big lines with uh, the embassies. Right, that's what powers need. So in uh, 
other countries, they started going to embassies. They started lining up there because that's what powers need. They need to register people. And here they would have gone to the drafting commissions and got in line to make sure they have this SEMP and they're registered. The thing is, I think we should stop scaring people. I think we should be explaining things more. Me, when I was scaring people, I was explaining why. Them, they're just scaring people and uh, not really making things clear. They, I think one of the main problems of our leadership is that they don't understand the people they're running, they're governing, that the character of our government system doesn't match the people that live in the country. This is all post-Soviet story. The Ukrainian can forgive a lot of things. The only things the Ukrainian doesn't forgive is when his opinion is being neglected, when he is not being listened to, when he is being neglected by the bureaucratic system. And so this is the same old problem of dignity. And powers need to understand that in order for them to have some dignity and trust from citizens, they need to rebuild the communicating system and need to know and keep that in mind that they are not talking with to mobilization resource or to some uh, dumb lumpen areas. They are talking to citizens. They need a feedback. You need to communicate with citizens and you need to do it right. Vasily, a simple experiment here. Imagine yourself having a lot of kids and then somebody came to you from the government and said, well, Vasily, we need you on the list. We just need to understand our reserves, your military specialty, and we need to make sure that you're on the list. Would you resist? Yeah, I would come and I would put my name. Exactly, so people would do. People would be cursing our bureaucracy, they'll be not too happy in these lines, but they would still go. And instead, what they're doing, people who have uh, traveled for thousands of kilometers to the border with their things and spent time and effort to do that, and then they're being turned at the border. Go back and do some stamp. Who does it? All right, let's continue. And from the share of criticism that sounded in about uh, that matter with communicating uh, about communicating with people, I want to switch to more optimistic topics. And I want to pay attention to the fact that our president of Ukraine actually visited Avdivka. And I think this is a great signal to the servicemen, to the army, and to the society. Right, indeed, Vasily, you cannot take away his bravery. Um, you can take away other things, you can criticize him extensively, and I'm doing that with pleasure. Actually, not without any, without, not with pleasure. I don't like it, but I had to. Um, but he indeed traveled to a difficult part of the front, to essentially a semi-surrounded area, semi-encircled area. He came and personally visited the brigade that is holding the enemy there, and he cheered our troops there. Now, again, it happened after a lot of criticism from Yuri Butusov, who was um, pointing out the deficiency of support for the military. So at least it happened after. But again, I'm concerned about the level of communication because our society is continues to learn about the key problems from foreign press or from journalists criticizing the power. And the power starts to communicate with people only a series of media scandals. They do not do that as a planned system politics, right? At least though, so, at least in this way. All right. Guys, let's uh, go to questions. Hang on, Vasily. I also want to add here that the visit of the president also would mean that the level of signal from the ground is such that it makes sense to throw such a heavyweight figure. And again, it means that situation here of Divka is rather dire, that it actually needed the visit of such a high caliber person. And yeah, it, they needed, so he came. Exactly. I don't have personal attacks against Zelensky. When he is great, he is great, right? When the power is making right decisions, we're cheering. When they're making wrong decisions that need to be criticized, we do criticize. By the way, I did communicate all that openly, and I'm not saying anything out in public now on the streams that I haven't told them personally when I was in the office. All right, guys, I think your like button is broken. We only have 6,000 likes versus 33,000 viewers. So, yeah, it, it is all fake, right? It is all not real, as uh, our critics are saying. Right, exactly, Vasily. I'm just sitting here, coming from hundreds of accounts and uh, watching us, right, from all the phones. Okay, so 
from the viewers a question. Alexei, imagine you have an opponent who understands the situation as well as you do and is of similar opinions. What advice, how, what's the prediction you would give for 24? Okay, so everything depends upon the level of support. Economic support is rather problematized, who basically um, our, our allies are still to vote on support and our Ministry of Finance already came out and said they have no resources and suggested to, for military to look for resources, which is already weird. So that indicates that situation in the country, which is already strained, will probably get more problematic in 2024. That creates precursors to possible social unrest, which we, to say the least, very undesirable for us. Now, then again, if they give us all the dollars of the world, we cannot load them, we cannot put them in our guns and shoot with them. So, and here is an interesting point. We don't know the minimum of shells and supplies that we need in order to hold the country on the front line. I think General Command knows that, but they would not officially put it out in the media. So, I don't know if our minimized level of support by our partners would allow us to hold the front. I'm a little bit conservative here, but I think even diminished aid from our partners would still probably allow us to hold the front. But it likely will mean that we'll lose some parts of the territory. I would warn immediately that it's not the brilliant attack by Russian some commanders that they would get to Dnieper and capture some new big territories. That's not what we're talking about. They can barely capture a regional center. So they can't even dream about that. They'll be slow grinding that they might get to Chasov Yar and eventually in several months uh, create a situation when they can take it. So even when they take a um, regional center like Marinka, this is not critical for our country. And the prognosis is that it will be difficult, but we will be able to weather it out. Our task is to stand in a strong defense line and make sure we take away the offensive potential of our enemy. Same thing that they did when we did counteroffensive all summer and autumn. Now it's just a different phase. Now we are in the defense position and we'll be grinding through their numbers, right? I remember, remind you that there was a March of 22 when everything was so hopeless that we had nothing to do but stand and shoot. And we stood and shoot and we prevailed. So we'll do it once again. We've done that before. It will not be easy, but um, we'll be able to stand. As for financial aid, if they give it, that'd be good. About the military aid, I'm still yeah, concerned, because the West failed to restart their full production as they wanted to. They still can make some minimum, so hopefully it will be enough. Otherwise, the general command will be voicing different solutions right now, and I'm not seeing them. So, so far, it's relatively speaking okay. So, do you think the signals from Russia that they're looking for peace um, have any meaning? I would say that there are reasons to look for aid for any uh, ally to try to strike peace is uh, an interesting point. It indicates that their situation is rather dire as well. And we're now in the situation when they throw their will, or their long will against us overall. And I'm skeptical that they can prevail this time because I think we need to produce just as long of a will as uh, they do. I think we have enough will as a country. And I understand that in under no circumstances we are going to surrender to them. That option should never be on the table. We should be using everything we have to not even discuss that. We're not going to surrender, so we will be fighting. Um, okay, let's also talk about the fundraiser. Yeah, there is a fundraiser under the stream. We are collecting money. By the way, thank you, viewers. We are closing these fundraisers real quickly. Thank you very much. We're gathering money for 25th uh, Storm Paratroopers Brigade. Do you have it in Telegram as well? I Yeah, I think we will put it right after the stream because I'm not sure if we already put that in the Telegram. Right, and I want to remind our viewers that under different channels there would be a different fundraiser on my channel there is a collection for drones for mavics for the 22nd oh, so for 72nd 
Right, that's interesting that you're gathering often for my brigade, for 72nd Brigade, in your streams, and I have other fundraisers under mine, but please, yes, yeah, support both, whichever you guys can. We love them all, all our fighters, so please support all of the fundraisers. Let's bring our victory closer together. Next question from yours. What will be changed in the mobilization law before it will be adopted? Okay, so look, the public upset that ran across the country that caused serious reaction across all the political forces in the parliament. Everybody came out and said that there are concerns. The Ombudsman for Human Rights in our country also came out and said that it is concerning, it violates certain things. And um, even though powers would want to mobilize people in that fashion, they don't want to take responsibility for all that. So I think the main screaming norms that are against the Constitution, they probably will be reviewed. And I think even the committee in our parliament, the preliminary committee will not let this uh, law through. For example, limiting the right to use credit cards and, and debit cards, limiting the right to use uh, financial instruments for people. So this is violation of people's rights. So I think this will be reviewed and I think Ultimately, this law will be converted to something tolerable, but again, it needs to be communicated properly, and I have concerns about the ability of our current government to do that. Right, there were several points there. Take away the driver's uh, license and rights to pilot a vehicle, take away the right to have bank accounts. So, when I, you know, when I was a little specter in a specter school um, for Intel, we had a trainer Lieutenant Kamushnikov. He was teaching us that when you're punishing a subordinate, you never punish them with rest, time off, money, and relations with their families. But you can punish them any way you like, but even the worst offender should see his mom or his girlfriend. He should not be having his money taken away. He should be able to go treat himself medically if he has issues. But otherwise, you should be punishing them uh, to the right extent of the offense, right? And we understood that being young cadets, but big people in charge of our country seem to not be in understanding of these simple truths. You cannot punish people with what they already earned or with what it is theirs truly human right, not even by constitution, but you know, it's an innate God given right. And when our government is trying to take away important things, such as family relations, for example, this is what the prohibition of leaving the country creates. I do not understand why they're doing that. I warned them before, you guys are playing with fire, you're playing with things that are in the core basis of trust to the government, and they should be very careful doing it. Thankfully, the pendulum is starting to swing in a different direction, so hopefully that will correct itself. But we have another issue coming up now, that we have a program from the Minister of Finance that we need to increase the monetary income from our citizens, right? There is a program now to slap an 18% tax on every transaction for money, uh, on any money transfer within Ukraine. That means that every soldier sending money home will be paying that money and uh, spending two months a year to satisfy the government demand. Right. I was looking for the source of these 18%. I only found Anatoly Amelian post about it. I haven't found legal documents about it. Well, I'll tell you, Anatoly Amelian is a, a very well-connected person who knows the inner works of it. And I think it is a great thing that he brought up this scandal, because that would probably allow us to cancel this measure, as it is being discussed in the corridors of power. Right, because. I know, you know, I changed my tone to be more optimistic that we're fighting and all, but it doesn't mean that we returned our heads to the warehouse. We still need to think. We still need them in our heads, on our shoulders. Um, why the government is not going? And that's a question to the government now. Why do they always have to go through repressions? Why not to go via the road of reward? Okay, you suggest. You criticize, you should suggest. How do, do they do that? Well, they should create a mechanism that simplifies conducting business to increase the business chances of surviving in this country in this in these times well they need money alexei where do they get the money from 
Well, here's the problem, uh, Vasily. If they continue limiting businesses, they'll just push them into the shadow. They'll have even fewer taxpayers. Right? With all the blockage of transfers and all the limitations, all the businessmen will just take the money from the official routes and use the semi-official ones. So, at the time when you essentially need to increase your taxpayers' base, you're limiting your taxpayers' base by punishment. And the character of relation of the government uh, that the government has with people is problematic. Our government, it, I almost have a feeling that it was imported from Mars or somewhere, that they view the people, the citizens of the country as their pasture. They should be viewing them differently. They should be viewing the society as partners, especially when the question of our survival is still on the agenda. Another question, do you think Russians will attack Zaporozhye nuclear station and will there be massive attacks in winter? I think they will be attacking us in winter. They likely will be a bit smaller than last year, but still they will be in numbers. Uh, as for Zaporozhye nuclear station, they're holding it now. Why would they be attacking it? Next question from you, do Europeans understand that same attacks as happened in Ukraine yesterday? Do people in Europe understand that they may face the same threat soon? No, they're asleep. There are some voices in Europe and the states that indicate that the threat exists. And in Poland, they already had uh, one of the Russian missiles breaking border. So they think that they're still safe. They just built several bomb shelters for villagers in the places where the previous missiles fell. And they put several air defense systems along the border with hopes that they will be able to protect them. Well, I hope to see one day that these systems actually shoot any of Russian missiles that are threatening to fly into their territory. And what concerns me is that American troops have been attacked over a hundred times by pro-Iranian uh, proxies in different places. There was no response, there was no collective response. Americans are afraid to start a new war that uh, they will not be able to wage successfully, so they're afraid to react. And then just outlines that the West is in a very bad sports shape, and that bad shape also covers the areas of support for us, and that's the problem. So you mentioned the missile that recently flew on the territory of Poland. God forbid, but if it happens that one of the neighbor's territories, Poland, Romania, maybe not take Hungary, but Slovakia, what if the missile falls there and creates some damage? Do you think there'll be any reaction? You mean military? No, there won't be. What kind? Well, they'll probably say something, they'll probably add some sanctions, right? They'll express deep, deep concern? Yes. But generally the West is asleep. They never came to this war that they were invited to. Russia declares that it's fighting with the West, and the West didn't come to that war. They didn't even come to help those who are fighting this war. There is no even a strain of effort to aid or not even understanding the level of strain they need to exert. So this is a very weak spot of the West and the whole situation, so we'll have to fight on our own. We don't have any other options. Okay. Well, it helps partly, right? So that's what we can rely on. That's about it. All right, next question. Alexei, in parenthesis, New Year question. What is your biggest achievement and biggest failure in this year in public life? Well, I don't measure myself in these categories. If I'd been measuring myself with achievements and failures, I would never afford the situation when I was second by popularity in the country and now fell to what my negative 81%. I would be wearing Ukrainian shirt, I would be saying all the right words. I'd probably not be able to hold the second most popular position, but I would still stay within the top 10. But my task, the way my mission, the way I see it, is to say the truth. And I don't care about my rating. I have other principles in life. And I said that before. Honesty and precision, that's what I'm interested in. All the ratings, I don't give a damn. I will flush any career or personal perspectives or election perspectives if I, if that means that I will not be able to be honest and to be telling what I believe. This is my main principle. You may not believe me if you want, but that's what I declare. And those attacks, ad hominem attacks, when people are saying, on one hand, he is such a manipulator and so cunning, but on the other hand, he, he is such a 
douche, he had a huge rating and then he drained it all down the toilet. So guys, if I was so cunning, I wouldn't drain my rating, right? But the thing is, I'm not interested in, in the rating. I'm interested in honesty and precision. Next question from viewer. Alexei, why Putin is so afraid of Ukraine joining NATO and European Union? Well, okay, they really perceive that as a threat. And you can see, you can laugh at it, at their decision and their perception on their side. But they are ready to fight and die for this. And if these ideas are being supported to the level that they are ready to fight for it, to wage war for it, then these ideas become material. And we, as I warned before uh, a few years ago, I did mention that us going to NATO will cost us a big war. And Russians told us about that too. Uh, you talked about that in the 19th, yeah, 19th, 17th, even earlier. And they warned us. Russia actually warned us we will be fighting with you if you go to NATO. And we were supposed to be preparing for this war. And we didn't. There is other rhetoric that independent Ukraine is a reason for war and NATO is our usual desire to be protected, right? But in this case, friends, our responsibility is ours too. Because if we knew that Russia perceives independent Ukraine as a threat, then we should have been prepared for this war as well. We should have been paying the real price for independence and be preparing for this war. And instead, we took the biggest military group that we had in Europe after USSR fell apart. We sold it. Do you know how many Su-25 fighters we sold after 2014? How many? Um, I don't remember exact number, but it was over 20. So somewhere right before the war. We shouldn't be done, shouldn't be doing that. These are strategic mistakes that we made. We need to be repeating them and talking about them till the last one of us, till the last child in our kindergarten understands and remembers that if you are conducting independent politics with a neighbor like Russia, then the price for that will be huge difficulties with that neighbor. And you must be ready to these difficulties. And we were conducting these politics but we are not preparing for the consequences. And that's a behavior of food, not a smart politician. When we were doing what we want, and now they came here to eat us. And we've been preparing for these issues so well that now we cannot really defend ourselves, right? Article 25 of the United Nations, each country uh, has its own, on its own to defend itself, has, a, has to have enough effort, enough resources to be able to defend itself. Right. So we should have been able to defend ourselves, but we can't, right? And that was part of the discussion in uh, Turkey back in the days that uh, when Russia wanted us to have a smaller army, it was against the United Nations Charter that we should have a right to defend ourselves. And they tried to resist, but you cannot go around United Nations regulations like that. So according to United Nations, each country should have a right to defend itself, should have a right to form the military in the level that is necessary to defend itself. So the cost of our existence independently is a big war, and we knew that, and we were not preparing for it. Now we are in a situation when we cannot provide for independence and independent politics. And now we start talking about peace formulas and other things, and thank you to our partners that they are supporting us, but we need to conduct our policies in the manner, and politics in the manner that we should be able to defend ourselves. We still, however, are lacking in extraordinary measures, and the problem is that Russians have immensely more resources than we do. And they're fighting as if it is the matter of life and death for, for them. For us, this is indeed a matter of life and death, but we're not really straining to the degree that we should. So what the result can be? I don't want that result. And what do you mean by not straining enough? Well, because we still haven't adopted extraordinary measures in economy, in military production. We are repressing our economy and we're not doing military production in the extraordinary mode. When the task is being placed under personal responsibility, not standard bureaucratic procedures, why do you need extraordinary measures? Why did I put that in my presidential program? It's not that I like to walk with a gun, although I would like that, but because the extraordinary measures are there to minimize bureaucratic procedures to avoid that. 
Minister of Defense of Czech Republic recently was talking. What uh, did he say? That Russians have authoritarian regime, so they, by directive, by direct order, can produce faster and more than we do. Because for us, in order to negotiate the decision, it takes us months to settle it first. And this is Minister of Defense of Czech Republic. She acknowledges it on the official level. Czech Republic is the main producer of ammo for NATO. So, right, our allies are conducting a mortal battle with a lunch break. That's not how you conduct a mortal battle. So, until we also switch to extraordinary measures here, we will not win. Our Minister of Defense is saying that they have UAVs that can fly for 3,000 kilometers. Okay, but where is the battle use? Because one thing is you're talking about that and making PR things, show them on the front, show the, their effectiveness on the front. That's how it should work. You put a person to run the ministry, you put somebody in charge, you give him two months to use the first drone. If not, you carry personal responsibility all the way up to criminal. And that's the only way to make it work, because in a mortal fight you cannot have a lunch break and a, and a weekend. Right, but we have something self-produced, right? We're using some. Yeah, we are, but it is immeasurably little in relation to our real needs. So tell me what are we using in Belgrade? But Belgrade is not far, that's something d different, it's not something far-flying. Right, but I'm just curious myself. Well. This is not my zone of responsibility. You can ask military people to ask to, to answer this question. You can ask the army. This is not uh, something I should be commenting on. Please ask Alexei if he'll um, put online an element of the meeting with Bukov and Russian opposition. Um, no, I won't. I was still in the mode of uh, scaring the audience and uh, I was talking to the Russian-speaking audience and to Russian opposition, so don't listen to that. Better listen to me, optimistic now, who's saying we'll survive, we'll stand and we'll kick their ass. Okay, guys, in the commentary, do you see that the mood is different? Do you see Alexei's mood is different? Right, yours mood should change as well. I think we've scared enough. I do not regret that I used that strategy some thoughts are difficult to communicate otherwise, but it's a different frame now, it's a different stage that I feel is changing. And uh, the current stage is, again, the Cossacks energy and drive. So, guys, once again, please give me a present. I want 250 subscribe, thousand subscribers on Vasily Galovanov's channel, so please subscribe if you can. I'm just a little bit shy of that number. We have 42,000 viewing us live. If just a half of you subscribes, I'll have a super nice uh, Christmas present, a New Year present. Right, so I have a question. Guys, imagine me and you talking somewhere in the park. Why you're not subscribing? You're regularly viewing these streams, but over half of you do not subscribe. You don't click the like button. What's holding you? Scary FSB or SBU is uh, watching over your shoulder that the moment you click subscribe for Galvanos channel, there'll be people knocking on your door, door. Is that why? Friends, this is not hard, right? It's just clicking one button. It doesn't cost you money, time or effort. Please do it. And again, I do like people who bring the question, what can be done in this situation? What can be done? How do we solve this critical element? Guys, every like click that you do is additional 10 suggestions on YouTube. That's increasing the audience. Every subscription that brings up the rating of the channel and all the videos that it produces. You are doing a real work in this moment, which allows you to increase the point of view of people who are siding with you. Guys, what revolution are you dreaming about? And I'm not talking about the street revolution, I'm talking about the change in the country. If you cannot do a simple thing, if you cannot be persuaded to click the like button. All right, I'm expecting a tsunami of likes. Next question about what to do. Alexei, please advise what we need to do here in Ukraine today in order to allow Ukraine to become a more effective country. Okay. You and I are in a situation of a big war for the survival of nation, so that we do not lose our independence and do not fall under more people here from Russia who did Bucha already. So in these conditions, 
The power is very concentrated in the hands of several people. Like Zyansky said, five or six people from my team. Five, six, right? I laughed at that phrase. Who is that sixth who appears and disappears, right? The vanishing one. So these people make all decisions. But what can you do? What actually works in these conditions? The feedback related to media is important. Media becomes a strongest lever to affect the leadership. We talked today about mobilization law, about the 18%. Only these scandals make president to change his mind, to actually go to Avdivka when it's needed. Only these tools allow us to change things, so we should be using it. But in order to use that, in order to communicate these signals, and trust me, they are listening to me and to Vasily. It's not so good to boast, but I'll bring an interesting example here. Have you seen President's press conference? Rhetoric question, right? Did you notice that he was asked only the questions that you guys are posting here in these streams with your help? And even with the same phrases, same words that you are using here. This is to answer the question how nobody pays attention to you. You have huge influence. And we, as your channel, channelizers, me and Vasily, can produce that, can focus that on our power. And I know how our government works. I've spent two and a half years with them, and rather fruitful years. I know whose interview is being reviewed, who's been edited, censored, and all. You have direct power. Like, subscribe, communicate. Because if you refuse to exert that, and you know what power is, right? It's a suggestion. It's the right to pose questions and to remove questions. You have that power in your hands. You are posting questions. We created this program on purpose, so you have some part of power in your hands to ask these questions, and you're not using that. What um, else can we be talking about, right? You are given tools of power. All you need to do is literally click that like button and it shows it to 10 more people. You've done that. That's your handiwork. But yeah, some of you just refuse to do that. Then don't ask why you can't run your country. All right, next question from our viewer, human capital. Students, what's with them? Pandemic, online training, not enough specialists, education system and uh, stagnation. What do we do to make sure our students would want to work in Ukraine? This is a tragedy. Every reformation in the country needs to start with health system and education systems. That PC questionnaire that shocked everybody, including Germans and us, we are in a very difficult situation. And I remind that according to another research that I showed some slides from, back in the 12th, 2012, we were on the level of Israel, Poland and South Korea in our education. Since then, there basically happened a tragedy. And the main part of that was disappearance of trade schools and those would be the people who would be helping us to produce industrially our military needs to satisfy our needs so trade training is very important and and another aspect would be engineering and now engineers who would be building our new tools who would be developing our new tools to win the victory they are now armed and going to take the groves and trenches from the enemy so Unfortunately, there is a big glaring hole in that part. And we need to emphasize return of the trade school. We need to make it prestigious again. This is a valid part of a society, a valid level of workforce that is absolutely needed. We need new industrialization. And without trade schools, it's impossible to prop it up. Without business, science, and government triangle and making it mutually profitable, mutually dependent, we cannot survive. And by the way, we're still in the top five countries in the world that can produce missiles and aviation. We're one of them still. We still can pull it up. We still can save specialists from Yuzhmash. Uh, we still have those 75 year old who have a ton of experience from the rocket industry and the Soviet days. And we unfortunately are not doing that. And I will never forget that, and I will be bringing it up every stream in every every platform that I get, that education needs to be concentrated on, and not what our Minister of Education is concentrating on right now. 
Well, people will say it's not a good time, it's war. Well, if you don't have education, if you don't have trade schools, you have no people to build uh, certain things, systems, you do not have people to make your artillery shells and bullets. This is trade schools, Kadri. What, we cannot copy that damn Shahed UAV that is being assembled somewhere in Iranian garages? And this is the country who had Antonov, Karolev and Yuzhmash, and we still have it, right? It's still working. So where? All right, so wait. Wait, Alexei, if we have Yuzhmash, if we still have people who remember how to and do the, know the know-how, why are we not doing it? Are we not manufacturing? Well, because these people are not allowed, and I'm going to be blunt here, they are not allowed to be in at the table of pulling apart the defense budget. Those aviation gliding bombs that Russians are dropping at us, this is a dumb aviation bomb with a couple of things added on it. Yes, they are not too precise and still is a problem. So I suggest, I heard this suggestion and I saw our analog of that back in 2015. Our engineers, one constructor bureau, suggested that here are these people who worked all their lives in aviation. This is a suggestion. We have a ton of dumb bombs that we can make much smarter. Up until today, that has not been done. And they're already problematic for us when Russians use them. We have our developments, but unfortunately nothing was done because that scheme is very corrupt. Back in the times of Yanukovych, everybody got intermarried, uh, interrelated, and they all represent a single monolith clan of those who are allowed to the military budget and to those who control the military budget. There is a real mafia there, a proper breeding of government and bureaucrats with criminal that are eating our military budgetary money. And they allow very few people to in. And as they're talking about the private successes, these are the right private companies that were especially allowed there because they followed certain ranks and paid certain people. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot more private entities that could do a lot more for our victory, but they're still not allowed to the table. That all is still monopolized, corrupted, and unfortunately very closed. And even my anti-corruption committee has no way to get into. I'll give you a simple example. Minister of Defense has seven aides, has seven uh, vice ministers. I don't know exactly the situation now, but that's what I observed for two years when I was in, in power. So, six of them, they run 625 million grivnas, and one of them was running 26 billion grivnas. And why do you think it was done this way? Why such a glaring disbalance that is against all the rules of management? Because it's so much easier to manage one person, to corrupt one person, to blackmail one person, even if there'll be a brave reformer in that position. This is how it works. All right, next question from your Alexei. With whom of the opponents would it be interesting for you to conduct an online communication, an online uh, session? Shvets, Panasenkov, anybody else? Panasenkov is not an opponent. Anybody else? Uh, all the others you mentioned are not of interest to me. I did ask you about Bukov. Okay, that's you in his interview, one of our listeners writing, is saying that civil society is expressing a serious resistance to you and says that you both have lost. Do you agree with this opinion? Why would we lose? Nothing is lost until we are alive. And you may not like me personally, like yourself, be demanding for whatever you goals you have. This is enough. Just continue fighting. And again, I don't care about my political perspectives. I am concerned with being precise and honest. You can hate me, but just be honest and be precise. And let's fight for Ukraine together. That's all we need. Alexei, will you aid in the adoption of the arms law, as in the United States? If I get my share in making political decisions, regardless of the form of it, executive power, parliament power, presidential power, the first thing I'll be demanding would be access to arms for our citizens, so that reservists would have it at their homes too. Because it's scientifically proven why it is important. Statistics and a lot of data show that it's important. I would say that armed citizen is a citizen, disarmed citizen is a slave. And that's it.
It's a very different system. It creates a very different system of interaction between the government and the armed citizen. Guys, we've been live for over an hour. That means it's time for us to thank you and thank Alexei. But one more question from our viewers and more of a request. Alexei, can you please wish us something good in this coming year? Guys, everything will be all right. Regardless whether we will get the aid and the amount we want or not, the situation is different from 1917, and Russia is not Bolsheviks. Russia is different now. They're also not too wise, not too smart. They're just a bit smarter than our military political leadership or some representatives thereof that could have taken certain decisions and just not doing it. But even though government is making decisions that are somewhat alien to its uh, or exploitary nature to our society, we still have learned something over the last hundred years. We survived in a much worse times and we will survive despite all the stupidity of the West and inefficiencies. Even the minimum that we have, I think, is enough for us to not give up and to not lose our independence. I cannot vouch for all the territories yet, but I can vouch for independence. And since we preserve independence and the foreign boot will not be on our necks, we're still free people who can make our decisions, including decisions that would allow a certain historic framework to start unwinding all that back. So, disregard, we're standing, we're supporting our military, we're holding, and that's what they get instead of Ukraine. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to all of you. Alexei, thank you. Thank you very much. Till we meet again in the next 2024. Goodbye. Dear viewers, please take care. Yourself, your families. Ukraine will win. And we will be discussing and celebrating it together. Till later.